Welcome everybody to the very first of our five part series for um, gardening at the higher elevations um, in uh, Northern Arizona. This class is put on and sponsored by the Coconino County Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program. So for those of you who have never heard of the Master Gardener Program. The Master Gardener Program is actually one of the largest, I hope all of you have heard of the Master Gardener Program, but it's one of the largest volunteer programs in the US. And um, what our volunteers do, so they're all trained, that they've gone through a very intensive 16 week training and they are here to do what they're gonna be doing tonight and throughout this series. They're here to, to educate our community on gardening. And um, a lot of people are taking this class from Flagstaff and you're probably well aware of the challenges that we face here at Elevation. So we're gonna be covering all of that um, in this series. So I would just like to thank all of our master gardeners who volunteered to help make this class possible. Um, this is a large class, as I mentioned before, we have um, almost a hundred people who have registered um, so please do your best to keep yourself muted so there aren't a whole lot of distractions while um, our presenter is talking tonight. So the way that this series is going to work, so um, all of you have registered and you, and you made it in um, before we had to close for res registration, but each week what I'm going to do is send out an email to you on Thursdays, and that email is going to contain a new Zoom link for the following week's class. So what's happened a lot is that with such a big list of people, um, when I uh, BCC you, when I'm sending out the emails, because I don't want to show everybody's emails, of course, or share them, um, sometimes those emails will go into your junk, junk or spam folder. So just um, be sure that you check your junk or spam folder on Thursday, and if you haven't received anything from me on um, Monday, by Monday, just go ahead and give me an email so I can make sure that to include you in all of the subsequent classes. Um, all of these sessions are going to be recorded and I'm going to place them up on our Coconino County Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. And I will be doing that um, every Wednesday morning um, after the session. So if you're unable to attend for some reason, then um, you can still watch the wonderful presentations, um, but just over our YouTube channel. And there are actually a lot of really great videos that you might find helpful on our YouTube channel that we've been making, um, especially over the pandemic. So. The way that this class is going to work is that each week we have different speakers, so it's going to be really fun. You get to hear from uh, quite a few different people. So this very first week is all about um, planning your vegetable garden at Elevation, and our speaker is a co longtime Coconino County Master Gardener, Jim Mast. Um, next week is going to be all about um, starting seeds at home and just general plant care. And I'll be teaching that class. Um, the following week, we have Frank Branham, who's also a Coconino County Master Gardener. And he's going to be talking about um, soils and composting. He's actually quite the compost guru here in Coconino County. After that, we'll have Jackie Alston, who is going to be presenting on season extension. And we will wrap up with the boss, the director of Coconino County Cooperative Extension and Master Gardener um, Coordinator, Hattie Braun. So I guess I should introduce myself. Um, my name's Gail Gradup. I am an, an Instructional Specialist Coordinator um, with Coconino County Cooperative Extension, where I've been for just a little over two years now. Um, so I work in the Master Gardener program. And just a little bit about my background. I um, I've been working with uh, plants in Northern Arizona for about 15 years now, uh, mostly with native plants, but um, I was a grower and a greenhouse manager for uh, probably a total of around six years. 
um, on and off at the Arboretum. And um, I just got my master's in ag ed from U of A, yay. Glad that's done. And I'm just really happy to be coordinating this class for you guys in our community. So with that, oh, I guess I should mention two questions. So since this class is really big, um, just go ahead and if you have questions, which you probably will, put those in the chat box. And um, Hattie and I are here to monitor the um, chat box. And if we can't answer your questions, then we'll just um, pause periodically throughout Jim's presentation. And um, then we will get him to address your questions. And hopefully you know, we'll have a little bit of time left over um, for questions as well. So without further ado, let's introduce our guest speaker who is um, Jim Mast. He has, he was in the very first Master Gardener program in our Master Gardener class in 1991. And he's been teaching the growing vegetables at elevation curriculum here in Coconino County since 1992. So he really knows what he's doing. And this is, he teaches in our Master Gardener class. And it's usually one of everybody's favorite class. They love Jim, he's full of knowledge. And um, with that, I will have Jim take it away. Thank you for being here. Thank you everybody for coming to the class this evening. Um, hopefully this will be very interesting and informative for everybody. Uh, my nickname is Tomato Jim, so that's why um, this first slide says that. However, please ignore the bottom line on that that says www.tomatojim.com. That's an old website and I no longer have that website. That website is no longer um, active, so just ignore that. Uh, the email that's listed on there is current, and if you want to ever email me with any questions about your garden, please feel free uh, to do so. So this evening we're going to be talking about planning your vegetable garden, and I can't overemphasize how important it is to plan your garden. Don't just decide one day, like May 1st or whatever, that you're just going to walk out there and you're just going to plant your garden and everything is going to be wonderful. Because at high elevation, uh, it's just not going to work that way. You have to plan ahead. It's very, very critical. Now, this evening, I can't tell you like exactly you're going to do this and this and this and this. What I will be telling you is a whole lot of concepts to use, a lot of things to get you thinking. We'll be talking about conditions that you're going to be working with and how you can adjust and accommodate some of these conditions to make things work for you at high elevation. So um, planning, again, is very, very important. I can't overemphasize it. So before we get into the actual planning, just stop and think for just a minute. Why would you want to grow your own vegetables in the first place? I mean, why bother? It's a lot of work. Why would you even want to do that? Number one is the quality of the produce that you grow. Anything that you grow is going to be far better than anything that you buy. And you can bring something in straight from your garden to your table. It's going to be fabulous. Uh, there's just no comparison. And some of these vegetables don't even taste remotely similar to what you buy in the store. It's pretty amazing. Another thing that's important is that you know what has gone into your plants. You know whether they were grown organically or not. You know whether they were sprayed with something or not. You know exactly what has happened to them, and you're responsible for what has happened to them. It's also really very, very good exercise. In fact, about 45 minutes of gardening has the same benefit as 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, believe it or not. So it really is good exercise. It's also relaxing and therapeutic. Um, I worked in a high-stress profession for many, many years, and gardening was really my outlet for stress release. It really is therapeutic. However, in Flagstaff, it can also be frustrating uh, quite a bit of the time too, but overall, overall, it's very therapeutic. And there's a whole field about um, horticultural therapeutics out there as well. Indeed, it's the most popular form of recreation in the United States. About 65% of the population participates in gardening in one way or another. So you're in good company when you're out there growing a garden. But what makes gardening different 
here in Flagstaff and the other high elevations um, in northern Arizona. Things are different here, and you need to figure out what's going to be different, and this has to be incorporated into your garden plan. So let's talk a little bit about what is different. Number one, we have a very short growing season compared to most places. Officially, the growing season in Flagstaff is 103 days. That's actually more than what it used to be. When I first started teaching these classes, the official growing season was 90 days. So with climate change, we have gained a little bit. However, what throws people off is when the growing season is. It's officially doesn't start until June 19th and goes to around September 21st. June 19th is very, very late uh, for a growing season to start. And it can be very deceptive because we have beautiful warm weather, March, April, May, and then all of a sudden it starts snowing in June. And you have to be able to deal with those kinds of things. And that needs to be incorporated into your planning. Another reason to know what you're going to do and when you're going to do it before you even start. We have late spring frost and early fall frost, which you have to learn to deal with. And there are many, many ways to deal with that. And when you have the class on seeds and extenders later on, you get a whole lot of information on how to deal with these early and late frosts. We also have a dry climate with very low humidity. And what are the driest months of the year? The driest months of the year are May and June. What are you doing in May and June? In May and June, you're trying to plant your garden and get it going, and you're doing it in a difficult time of the year. It's challenging. Also, we have a lot of wind, and depending on where you live, you may have a whole lot of wind. And once again, the windiest time of the year is when you're trying to plant. And that adds a further challenge on getting things going uh, in the spring. We have very poor soil, and that is exactly what a lot of our soils look like. So you need to be aware of that and know that you're going to have to deal with the soil. That needs to be part of your planning as well. If you do not deal with the soil, you will not have a good vegetable garden in five step or anywhere in Northern Arizona. So just be aware, poor soil conditions, you need to deal with that. We have very cool summer nights and a lot of plants don't really like that. So you need to be able to deal with that as well. You need to be aware that that's a condition that you're going to be dealing with. We have very high sun intensity at high elevation. And again, some plants are prone to sunburn. Tomato plants, for example, will sunburn. So that's different too than in most places where you might be growing your vegetable garden. 7,000 feet provides intense sunshine. In fact, related to that, related to the intensity of the sun and to the low humidity, it can be as much as 25 degrees warmer in the sun than it is in the shade at any one time during the day. That is definitely going to affect the planning of your vegetable garden because you need to figure out where those warmer places are, where those cooler places are, and use them to your advantage. That has to be part of your planning as well. There are very large temperature swings from day to night. 40 degrees or more is routine pretty much year round. And again, that has to do with low humidity, the clear skies, the temperature just keeps going up and down and up and down and up and down. I grew up in the Midwest and there that doesn't really happen. There's only about 10 or 15 degrees difference between daytime and nighttime all year round. So in the winter, when it's very cold at night, it's also very cold during the day. But in the summer, when it's hot during the day, it's also pretty warm and pretty hot at night too. And um, that's really, desirable for a lot of vegetable plants. Here, we're swinging back and forth, which can throw a lot of plants off. Because we're located pretty far south, we're located right here, you know, in northern Arizona, we have relatively short day length in the summer. Our temperatures in the summer are more similar to very northern latitudes of the United States up around here, but these areas up here have much longer daylight in the summer. So what's happening during the daylight hours? The plants are photosynthesizing, the plants are growing, so they tend to grow faster 
and more in areas that have long daylight in the summer. We're down here right on the border between intermediate day and short day. Uh, 35 degree latitude is where that change takes place and Flagstaff, Flagstaff sits right exactly at 35 days latitude. And that actually influences some um, vegetable plants as well. So the first thing that we need to think about is selecting a site. Where are we going to put this thing? And again, you don't have to put all of your vegetable garden in one place. You can put things all over the place, all over your garden. You can have little bits of garden here, and little bits of garden there. But again, um, if you're thinking of putting a, a vegetable garden in one place, there are some conditions that you need to take into account on where you're going to place uh, your garden. Number one is convenience. Make it convenient. If it's not in a convenient location, if you have to go up and down flights of stairs, or if you have to walk way out into the North 40 uh, to get to your vegetable garden, chances are you're not going to be very good at taking care of it because it's just too much trouble. So make it convenient. However you go about doing it, use a convenient location. Exposure is important. And What's most appropriate for a vegetable garden is either a south-facing slope or a southeast-facing slope because that provides for you the best sun exposure uh, during the day. Anybody that's been observant and any time there, you'll notice there's always a lot more sunshine on the south side of your house than, is on the, than there is on the north side of your house. And it makes a difference in how plants are going to grow in those areas. So pay attention to um, the exposure. And if you're fortunate to have a south or southeast uh, exposure, take advantage of that. However, you may not be lucky to have, have that on your property. At high, ele high elevation, in general, you need to try to provide as much sun as possible. Again, it's not always possible. We live in a pine forest. And uh, a lot of you have lots of pine trees uh, on your property, which will cut into your sunshine. But try to find an area where there's going to be as much sun as possible, because it will help the plants grow in general better. Not appropriate for all garden plants, but for most of them. You're going to have to have water. So try to make the water source convenient as well. Try to position your garden where it's fairly close to a water source so that it's not inconvenient um, to water your garden. So now, what about the garden plan? What, are, what kind of things are we going to really talk about for the actual planning? Here's a real fancy plan that somebody did uh, in the UK uh, where they just kind of measured off uh, the site on where they're going to put it and divided it into sections and then marked out uh, where they were going to put various um, vegetables. That's a very organized uh, way of doing things. But again, uh, the most important thing is obviously you don't have to do it like that. The important concept here is the person had a plan. And when you have a plan, try to stick to the plan as much as possible. So this plan was made out ahead of time before the person did anything in the actual garden. You can plan it out however you want. You can plan it out on paper. You can plan it out on a computer. There are computer programs and apps available for garden planning. I have never done that. This is just the example of one. Uh, so if you're very computer savvy, this might be an interesting way um, to go about it. It looks really cool. And um, it would probably be fun to play with one of these programs um, to see how it works. Again, I've never done that. So I can't give you any of my personal experience on how that worked. But again, the main concept is plan it out ahead of time, uh, however you want to do that. I like to keep a journal. And you can do that on a computer. You can do that on paper. Um, I keep a journal from year to year. I basically write down everything that I did and when I did it, and I like to keep it. Um, you might think that you remember from one year to the next what you did where you planted stuff, when you planted stuff, how things did. But guess what? By the time the next season rolls around, you're likely to have forgotten much of what you did. 
And it's also just a useful information to refer to. Um, it's nice to know. And I have records going back almost 30 years, so I don't know what the cards did. And it's fun to look back over there to see what happened like in 1995 and what I did and how I came about it. It's very helpful. So again, things that I like to put into my journal are uh, what varieties of vegetables I planted, basically what I planted, uh, when I planted things, where I planted things, uh, when I harvested things, and then how things did. And I like to make general comments, like say for instance, I planted Nantes variety of carrots and I also planted Chatonet varieties of carrots. The Nantes did very well and the, Ch the Chatonet did very poorly and they were planted right beside each other. So maybe now we want to try the one variety the next time or try something different. So I, I do like to keep track of, of varieties and how things did. And just, you know, general comments uh, of um, how various things did and whether I think I, that's something I should try planting again the following year, or if that's something I don't want to ever do again, or, you know, if my site worked out well, or if it didn't, or if I need to change things, just make, I'd like to make comments when things are happening, because that way I remember them and it'll be accurate um, in the journal. So, more things that you need to decide when you're planning your garden again, I can't tell you exactly what's going to go into your plan, but I'll tell you things that you need to think about when you are planning. So here are some things that you need to consider when you're planning out your garden. Number one, what do you want to grow? Um, that's probably basic to everything else. Figure out ahead of time what you're going to grow and then pretty much where you're going to put it and how you're going to do it. It's important to know ahead of time what kind of soil preparation is going to be needed for your garden. Because as I mentioned before, there is going to need to be soil preparation. The best time to do that is in the fall, if you can. However, we're already moving into spring, so unless you already did it, you can't do it in the fall. You have to do it this year in the spring. So you need to research what you need to do to your soil and put that in your plan because that needs to be part of your plan. This all needs to happen before you can plant anything. Basically what you're gonna need to do is add organic material, compost, manure, um, kind of figure out if you're gonna need to add fertilizers, if you're gonna need to acidify the soil somewhat. Likely you will need to do all of those things, particularly if it's a new plant a new plot is, I'm, I mean, that has not grown a vegetable garden before. So take into consideration that soil preparation will have to be done and will have to be done ahead of time. So that is first and foremost, the first thing that goes into your plan. What kind of plant arrangements are you going to be, used, be using? And there's a whole lot of different things that you can do. This particular photograph is of a square foot garden. And what that means is the garden plot is divided into areas that are one foot square, and then different vegetables are planted in these compartments. Um, that system works really well in small spaces. It, it, you can purchase books or find a lot of information online on how to do square foot gardening. And it's an interesting way uh, to go about doing it. I have not done that personally myself because I was usually dealing with fairly large garden areas, but it's an interesting concept. A lot of good information on how to do that is available. You can plant things in traditional rows. You know, that's the traditional way of things, of doing things. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And particularly if you have a large garden, uh, that tends to work uh, very, very well. Uh, another offshoot of the single row method is using double rows. And that's what I have basically used uh, for many, many years is double rows. The reason for that, you know, what a double row is, is two rows are planted fairly close together. And then there's a space. And then there's another two rows or like a walkway in between. 
I have used, like to use drip irrigation or soaker hoses to water my garden. So double rows work really well with that. I plant a soaker hose right down the middle of this. You can easily water two rows off of one soaker hose. So that's kind of why I like double rows. Um, that has worked very well for me um, over the years. Wide rows also are a very efficient use of space. And if you're working with a smaller garden area, or if you really want to do an intensive uh, garden, I mean, wide rows work really, that work really very, very well. That just shows some pictures of how uh, wide row gardens work. And it looks like uh, this over here on the right, that looks like some sort of lettuce, has either surfer hoses or drip irrigation. And like perhaps here, there was going down in between those. Um, so again, you can do drip irrigation or soaker here irrigation even with the wide rows uh, if you so desire to do that. Raised beds work extremely well, particularly in cooler climate areas. Raised beds work very, very well. Uh, they look nice. You know, they provide a lot of interest and definition uh, to your garden. Um, so here are some advantages of using raised beds. It's really easier to improve and maintain the soil uh, in a raised bed because it's a more contained area. Um, it's just, you can really kind of concentrate uh, where you're improving the soil in a more um, defined area, I guess is how I would explain that. Because they're raised above ground level, they tend to be warmer. They tend to warm up sooner in the spring than ground level does. So that can be a very good advantage uh, in five set area. They tend to provide better change and good soil aeration. As I mentioned before, they provide um, good definition. They look neat. And they really provide better access for gardeners with disabilities. And these raised beds can be quite high. Um, they can be made wheelchair high, they can be made waist high, so that people that can't stoop over, people that can't bend over, people in wheelchairs can still do a lot of gardening with high raised beds. So that's another thing to think about. But again, all of these things, particularly if you're going to get into doing raised beds, that's going to require some construction work, has to be part of your planning, has to be done ahead of time. Some vegetables that you grow might require hills of some sort. Uh, those are potatoes, and those are traditionally um, commercially uh, grown in hills. Squash tends to grow well in hills, and hills are just mounds of soil. Cucumbers grow well in hills because uh, uh, hills tend to be warm, uh, for one thing. So that's something to consider. Again, has to be part of your plan if you're going to get into that. What about uh, adding vertical space to your garden? You might want to plant peas. You might want to plant pole beans, something that requires some vertical space. Or if you're dealing with a really small garden area, you can grow things up. You can grow uh, pumpkins and squash up on trellises. You can grow melons and cucumbers up onto trellises. So take it, you can take advantage of vertical space. And that vertical space, and I'll explain a little bit later, actually can provide some shade for some of your plants that might want to have some shade. But again, if you're going to do some vertical gardening, it has to be part of your plan. That has to be done ahead of time, and it's going to require some construction and some materials. So say you're going to plant things in rows or double rows or wide rows. What's the best way to orient them? How are you going to aim them? The best way to do that is to have them going from north to south, south to north. Do not direct them east to west if you can possibly do that. Now, again, depending on where your garden is located on the property, east-west orientation may be the only thing that you can do. But if you have the option, the better thing to do is north to south. And that has to do with the sunlight. What that does is that provides even sunshine throughout the length of the road throughout the day. East-West orientation tends to cause 
um, part of that row to shade part of the row and you end up with rows of vegetables that are sloped short at one end and tall at the other end which is probably not desirable so north to south if you can do it is the better way to line things up you need to think about the presence of structures and trees that are on your property. Uh, this just shows a garden area that's kind of sandwiched between a garage and a couple of fences and with a great big tree uh, growing right there. All of those things are going to influence the microclimates within that garden. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes, microclimates are very important um, in your vegetable garden. So these things are going to provide a lot of shade depending on how this garden is oriented. Now, if this open end of the garden uh, facing out this way is open to the south, that is probably a good way that that's um, lined up. If it's the other way around, there may be a lot of problems with that. However, these structures do provide some advantages in that they provide a wind break. And if you live in a windy area, that can actually be a good thing. So it's going to affect the wind flow, but it's also going to affect sun and shade throughout the day. You know, and you're not going to knock down your house or knock down your fences, probably. So just, you know, think about it. Observe how is that going to influence how your garden is going to do. Remember, we have a very short growing season, so we don't have a lot of room for error. If things aren't going well, you don't really have time to redo things halfway through the summer. You just don't have enough time to do that. So how are we going to go about watering this thing? You are going to have to water your garden at least part of the year. If we're fortunate to have a very heavy monsoon, you can get away in August and parts of July without having to water very much. But particularly early in the season, you're going to have to water a lot in order to germinate seeds in order for your garden to get going. As I've talked before, make sure your water source is convenient. But what are some good ways to water your garden and what are some not good ways to water your garden? Keep in mind that water is very precious. It's expensive. You don't want to waste it. And it will be your biggest expense um, for your garden. Drip irrigation is probably the most efficient way uh, to water your garden. There's no waste at all. You don't lose anything to evaporation. You don't lose anything to water blowing in the wind. And the water only goes to where the plants are. It, it only goes to the roots of the plants. This just shows one drip irrigation system with where there's a hose, drip hose, and then with a hole punched in it, and the water just comes out right there. More often than not, there's a secondary hose attached to that that comes over to the plant and has an emitter on there that will emit the water at a specific rate, so many gallons per minute. Um, just there's not very good control when you do it um, this way. Um, soaker hoses are very similar uh, to standard drip irrigation, and soaker hoses is what I have used for many, many, many years. This just shows you what soaker hoses look like. The difference between this and standard drip irrigation is that this soaker hose is going to weep water slowly from the entire shows the soaker hoses in cross section and kind of different thicknesses. Anyway, this entire length will just slowly leak water and uh, look at that. This is showing a single row along each soaker hose. I like to put a row right up against it on both sides. So I get a double row out of each soaker hose. And if you put these real close together, you could create a wide way uh, using soaker hoses. I also, when I use soaker hoses, I do not leave them on top of the ground. I dig a shallow trench and put them underground and cover them with a, maybe an inch at most of soil. And what that does is that even gets the, soil, gets the water down to your root zones even more efficiently and with even less waste. Because even this way, you're going to get absolute evaporation um, doing it this way. So, anyway. Highly recommend soaker hoses. They have worked very, very well for me for many, many, many years. And you can use them from one year to the next. I can usually get about five years out of one soaker hose before they clog up the mineral content and don't work anymore. You can do furrow irrigation, which is the traditional method of growing a garden in the desert. 
um, uses lots and lots of water. Uh, probably not a good idea for five staff. Um, probably not appropriate for five staff in high elevation. In northern Arizona, this would be more appropriate in the Phoenix area, but that is a way that you can do it. This is probably the worst way to water your garden is using sprinklers. Uh, it's convenient in that all you have to do is go turn it on. However, you're probably losing at least half of that water. You lose it to the wind, you lose it to evaporation. If there's any wind at all, and probably some of us have some wind, that water is going to go every place except where you need it. So if you can avoid, avoid it, uh, try to stay away from using sprinklers. Or if you have a lot of time in your hands, you can always water things by hand. And there have been times that I have done this um, when I really had no other option. Um, I worked in community garden one year, and really my only option was to hand water. So that's what we did. It's very, very labor intensive. It takes a lot of time. But it was a very small plot. And we had three people, actually four people, that were able to do it. So. And we had to do this every day and sometimes twice a day. So um, if you've got a lot of time in your hands, uh, do it. It's actually very therapeutic to water your plants by hand, but for the most part, I just don't have time to do that. So um, something to think about. Consider using mulch. Um, mulch can serve water and in our climate. And we're trying to conserve every drop of water that we've got. Consider using mulches on your garden as much as possible. And the mulches also influence the temperatures of your soil. And you can use that to your advantage as well. And again, this also needs part of your plan. If you're going to mulch, you need to have materials available, and you need to know when you're going to apply the mulch. Basically, organic mulches, such as straw that is shown there, leaves, hay, anything that was recently alive is an organic mulch. Those tend to cool the soil, in Flagstaff, it's recommended that you don't put those on your garden until around July 1st. If you put the mulches on too early, it tends to keep the soil too cold and the plants will not grow very quickly. They won't grow as quickly as they need to. Inorganic mulches, such as plastics and gravel and cinders and rocks, those are in organic mulches, they, and they also conserve water very well. However, they tend to heat the soil rather than cool the soil. But you can use that to your advantage in areas that you need to do that. So keep in mind, that's part of your planning as well. So importantly, you need to figure out basically where you're going to put what in your garden. Uh, you're going to have tall plants, and you're going to have short plants. Some of those plants need a lot of sun. Some of them are going to need some shade. Um, pay attention to how tall plants you're going to get and tall plants that are up on trellises uh, or poles are going to throw shade onto part of your garden. However, again, you can use that to your advantage. Basically, cool weather vegetables can handle some shade. I used to use corn such as this to shade lettuce and radishes and uh, cabbages that needed some shade. So that was part of my garden plan as well. So pay attention to how big these things are going to get. And that'll need to influence where you're going to put them in your garden. Again, I've been talking quite a bit about microclimates because microclimates are critical uh, in your garden at high elevation where you have a short season. Um, Basically, you're going to have warm parts of your garden. You're going to have cool parts of your garden. Observe what those are. Just observe where the warm places are. Observe where the cool places are. Plant appropriately. Put plants that need warm weather in the warm weather areas and plants that need cooler weather that, we, that can handle some shade. Put them in the cooler areas. And you can uh, manipulate the microclimates as you need to. I don't have time to get into all the specifics on how to do that, but um, pay attention. Microclimates are one of the things in five stack that can really make or break uh, how your garden is going to do. Again, you have such a short season that if you mess this up and put things in the wrong place, 
you don't have time to redo it because the season is too short. You can't start over uh, in the middle of the season. So again, I talked about warm versus cool weather vegetables. The ones on the left are warm weather vegetables, such as peppers, tomatoes, cucumbers, eggplants fit into that uh, category, squash, pumpkins, melons. All of those are warm weather vegetables. They need a warm microclimate. So provide that for them, do whatever you can to have a warm microclimate for them to do well, for them to thrive. These on the right are cool weather vegetables. Those include lettuces, um, root crops such as carrots, radishes, turnips, uh, cabbage family such as broccoli that's shown there, cabbage, um, kohlrabi, uh, kale, the whole onion families, it's just showing some onions, onions, garlic, leeks, beets here, all of those are cool weather vegetables. Um, they can handle some shade. They can plant it, be planted earlier than these. It needs to be part of your garden planting. So how much space are you going to need for specific plants? This is kind of a really interesting little spacing guide on that kind of tells you um, how much room various crops are going to need, starting at the bottom, uh, such as uh, carrots, uh, parsnips, and so forth, that should be planted just two inches apart because they don't take up a lot of room. And then as you move up this ladder, the plants are getting larger and larger and larger. They're going to need a whole lot more space. They're going to have to be planted farther apart because they're going to take up a lot more room. So this is a very, very important part of your garden plan as well, is spacing. Keep in mind, if you've got a small garden space, you may not be able to grow some of these things because you're just not going to have enough room. I'm going to leave this chart up for just a few more seconds just so you can take in some of that information um, if you like. So, spacing, part of your plan. Crop rotation. This is another thing you need to think about as far as your planning goes. If this is the first time you are planting a garden in a specific place, then you don't need to think about crop rotation. The importance of crop rotation is that means you don't plant the same thing in exactly the same place two years in a row, if possible. Because if you do, it tends to deplete specific nutrients from the garden soil, and you'll have many, many more insect and disease problems. So if you rotate crops from year to year to year to year to year, that's another thing that's going to create a more successful vegetable garden for you. This is one chart on that's a really good one uh, on a specific type of crop rotation in a vegetable garden. That's one that tends to work where you, you know you put peas, you know, where that shows where something was planted, and the arrow shows where you put it the next year. Like you put the potatoes down here where the corn was the following year and so forth and go around in a circle. I don't remember who's um, where I got that. Belonged to some famous gardener. I did not make that up, but it's, it's one that tends to work pretty well. Companion planting is another thing to think about uh, in your planning. And what companion planting means is that some vegetables tend to like being close to other vegetables, specific ones. Some vegetables, for some reason, tend to repel specific other vegetables. This gets really complicated. I truthfully have not paid very much attention to this over the years. Um, I tend to space things out well enough, so I don't know that companion planting would be really relevant anyway. But if that's something that you're interested in doing, um, something to think about. And again, that has to go into your garden plan right from the get-go. One thing that I do know works well for companion planting down here under tomatoes 
is it mentions basil. And that's one thing that I have always done is planted basil right in with my tomato plants. Like if, there, if I'm growing in pots, I put basil in the pot. If, it, if I'm growing in the garden, I'm putting basil just right up against the tomato plants. For some reason, they do seem to, those two seem to have a beneficial uh, relationship to each other. But again, that's a chart you can study when you have a lot of time because <laughs> it is uh, quite complicated. But again, it's something that has to go into a garden plan. What about wind protection? If you happen to live in Delhi Park, where I lived for almost 30 years, uh, wind is a huge problem and you do need to deal with it. Some um, vegetable plants, tomatoes in particular, do not like the wind. You do have to provide some sort of wind protection, however you want to go about doing that. If you live in a particularly windy area, so think about that, because that has to be part of your plan as well. Here just are some examples of some wind breaks. This one on the left is pretty fancy, <laughs> where they planted hedges um, and to make a very enclosed uh, garden area. But again, that's quite the wind break. I'm not sure on this one on the right side what kind of material that is, but but those are specifically specifically put there for wind breaks. And um, they have it on each one on each side of the garden. And again, I don't know what the orientation of this particular garden is, but I assume that the prevailing wind is hitting this right here on the end, and that is going to protect some of these plants here from the wind. So take that into account as well. Season extenders. Uh, again, I'm not going to talk very much about season extenders because you are going to have an entire class on uh, season extenders where you will get into a whole lot of detail on how to do this. Uh, these two are particularly common ones that I have used. Uh, the one on the left is just uh, water jugs or milk jugs that you cut the bottom out and you stick those on top of plants early in the season. Uh, by doing that, you can protect those plants from freezing temperatures and plant the plants out there much earlier than you might otherwise be able to do. The one on the right just shows a tomato plant planted within a wall of water uh, that provides a, a mini greenhouse. Again, you can plant things out earlier um, when you're um, using any kind of season extenders. Again, timing is part of your plan and season extenders are going to change and influence your timing. So this needs to be part of your plan as well. Again, this is just showing some more season extenders. The one on the left is a cold frame. Uh, this is a row cover uh, with support to uh, keep it in place. Any of those things will help make and create a longer season for you. So timing. Timing is one of the very critical things for growing your garden in five stack. You need to learn when the appropriate time is for doing specific activities, uh, particularly in the spring, but timing also extends throughout the entire year, not just the spring, but throughout the entire year. This particular photo that I have here is of the Flagstaff Planting Guide. That is a wonderful resource that Julie Lancaster, um, along with collaboration with several master gardeners, including myself, put together, put together several years ago. Um, you can purchase these, I think, at Warner's and also at Viola's nursery. I'm not sure where all of these are available, but that is a really useful resource, not just on timing, but on pretty much anything you want to know about Flagstaff gardening is crammed into this little guide. It's just one double-sided um, guide. It's, um, it's laminated, so you can take it out in the garden with you without uh, leaning it. <laughs> if it gets wet. So I highly recommend that you try to find one of these and um, study that and use that to your advantage, particularly with planning. This really helps you with your planning. It has a garden calendar on there as part of it. So that's something to consider. Um, 
as a good resource uh, for your planning. The other thing um, when you're planning things out is to select appropriate varieties um, for your vegetable garden because not all varieties are going to work at high elevation. So you need to educate yourself on what varieties are going to work and the, where you can find sources for good seeds for our area. In general, as a general rule, you've got to want to use short season varieties for most things or intermediate season varieties for some things. Um, most vegetables, long season varieties don't work. And if you're not familiar, uh, if you go to buy seeds off the shelf, you may inadvertently be purchasing a lot of season varieties that may not work uh, very well in our area. So seed catalogs can be helpful for that. But our local um, home-owned nurseries, violas and warners, really carry varieties that are appropriate uh, for our area. For the most part, they do a much better job than what the big box stores do. So keep that in mind um, as well. So kind of to wrap things up somewhat, and so we have a lot of time for questions if we need it. Um, there are four principles for successful gardening in Flagstaff and other elevations, high elevations uh, in Northern Arizona. And basically, if you deal with these four issues, soil, microclimate, timing, and variety, and I've already talked about all of these, if you deal with these, you will have successful gardens. And I'm not talking only strictly about vegetable gardens, but this applies to flower gardens, the general landscaping, to trees, I mean, to all kinds of stuff. Um, these are the four things that you need to be aware of and that you need to deal with. Soil, for example, um, you will be talking about this probably a little bit more in one of the, the later classes. However, this is just a real simple little soil calendar uh, showing soil cycle. And this is basically what I do from year to year. This just shows down here at the bottom, winter, where we are now, moving into spring what you know, activities we're going to be doing during that time frame, and then when we get to spring, what we're going to be doing, moving into summer, and then we're coming into fall, and then we're going into winter, and then we start all over again. So basically, to summarize this, we're now in winter, we're moving on towards spring, so this is the time of the year that we're going to be adding sulfur and balanced fertilizers to our soil, that we're going to be ripping up our soil grit so we can plant it. And as we move from spring on towards summer, we're going to be planting. When we get to midsummer, we're going to need to fertilize some more to really give our soil and plants a boost. Then as we're moving towards fall, we're going to be harvesting. We're going to be cleaning up the garden. And then as we come into fall and we're moving towards winter, after we've done the cleanup, we're going to be adding compost and other organic materials to the soil because that's really the best and most appropriate time to do it. And then we're going to work the soil again um, because these things tend to compost better if they're worked into the soil rather than just left on top. And then we're going to move into winter. And then guess what? We're going to start all over again and we're going to go through this whole cycle again. Do we ever reach any point in time where we can stop doing this? No. The answer to that is no. We just keep going on and on and on and on and on because this organic material somehow seems to disappear from one year to the next. So you just keep doing that. So that's just a very simple synopsis on dealing with soil. Again, as I mentioned, microclimates are critical. It's another thing that can make or break how your vegetables are going to do in your, in your garden. And basically, you're going to put the cool vegetables in the cooler areas, you're going to put the warm vegetables in the warmer areas and not the other way around. Timing. Again, timing is absolutely critical because you don't have much room for error. Um, this is an extremely good timing chart 
it works really well. It's appropriate for how this area. And then this just shows you a continuum of timing on when you start to indoors, when you plant seeds outside, when you transplant some plants outside, when you're going to be harvesting things. Um, and it shows that continuum for various vegetables. And I said, that's really pretty appropriate um, for our area. So that's really a good slide to make a copy of, because that's one that you can refer to, refer to, and it's pretty accurate. Once again, though, if you are using seeds and extenders, that's going to modify the timing on this, as opposed to not uh, seeds and extenders. So again, timing is all important. Using appropriate varieties is also very, very important. This just shows two seed catalogs that are my personal favorites. There are many, 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 many seed catalogs out there that have very good quality seeds and very, uh, you know, very good to use. These two in particular, I've had the most success with. Uh, Pine Tree Garden Seeds on the right is located in Maine. Uh, they have a very extensive array of vegetable seeds, vegetable plants, and flower seeds, and plants. Uh, they're located in Maine, and I've never had a crop failure from anything that I've gotten from them. Their prices also seem to be the best. They have probably the lowest prices of anybody that I've come across. It's one I highly recommend, Pine Tree Garden Seeds. Johnny's Selected Seeds is another one that I personally like a lot. Um, they're also located in Maine. Um, they have a lot of their own patented varieties that they have developed for cool weather um, areas. Uh, they have good success uh, with Johnny's products. Uh, they tend to be a little bit more pricey. But the really nice thing about Johnny's catalog is that it has really extensive horticultural information in it that um, is actually appropriate for the five step area when there aren't too many resources out there that show appropriate information for our area. This, this one really does. I mean, for all of the various seeds they have in there, it tells you, you know, when to start them inside, when to plant them outside, and what they say actually works for us. So they're a good resource for that reason. So these are just good ones. That's just two out of many uh, that are available. I want to leave you with some words of wisdom uh, before we get into question and answer sessions. And that is a, something to think about is that a garden is half made when it is well planned. The best gardener is the one who does the most gardening by the winter fire. That's um, a quote from Liberty Hyde Bailey. Liberty Hyde Bailey was a very um, renowned botanist and horticulturist at Cornell University in the late 1800s, early 1900s. He did a lot of uh, botanical research, but he was also a very awesome professor, apparently. He was very, very popular um, on the faculty at Cornell. And his um, botanical research was aimed at how somebody could use botany towards growing a successful vegetable garden. He was really into home gardening, which was uh, kind of unique at that time. So that's just kind of interesting. Again, just driving home the point that gardening is really, really important. So do it. Go for it. There's no reason why you can't do it. Thank you so much for your attention this evening. And I'm open for questions for however long you were going to do. Thank you so much, Jen, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, since we do have quite a bit of time left over from question or for questions, I I'll um, I like to prompt the very first question, and I'm hoping that you can share some of your tried and true easiest <laughs> varieties with folks. So maybe. I mean, your, your name is Tomato Jim, your nickname. So maybe you can just um, throw out a few of those tomato varieties um, that have been, have proven successful for you over the years in, in Flagstaff. Sure. Um, 
there are lots and lots of them, um, tomato varieties that tend to work. And then regarding varieties, um, in general, the warm weather crops are more challenging to grow in Flagstaff than what the cool weather crops are. Uh, our conditions are pretty um, amenable to growing the cool weather crops. It's the warm weather crops that are more challenging. And tomatoes are probably the most challenging of all. And tomatoes, interestingly enough, are the most popular garden plant out there. Everybody wants to grow tomatoes. Why? Because they taste so fabulous uh, when you grow them yourself. Um, early girl is probably the standard variety that's been around for years and is what's often recommended um, for short season areas. However, I don't particularly like early girls. Um, they tend to not have very much flavor at all. Um, they have a real tough thick skin and they tend to be really watery. Um, so the texture isn't really good at all. So I just don't grow those. Um, my very favorite variety of all, and Maddie's familiar with this one, and that's one uh, that's called Kellogg's Breakfast. Um, that uh, beefsteak sized tomato that's kind of orange in color rather than red, they get great big and they actually get ripe. Um, in five step area, they're just wonderful tomato to grow in. It's called um, Kellogg's Breakfast. Um, there's another Czechoslovakian variety called Stupichka or Stupice, S T U P I C E. That's another one I've grown for many years with a whole lot of success. It's a red tomato. It's fairly small, but they're really, really tasty. Uh, Lemon Boy is a yellow tomato that works very, very well. Yellow pear is a yellow tomato. It's a real small one uh, that tends to grow um, very, very well. Uh, some of the heirloom varieties will do okay. Uh, Cherokee Purple um, usually will make it, and I've got some ripe tomatoes from those, and those taste um, fantastic. Uh, brandy Wine is another um, heirloom tomato that tastes fabulous. And it's kind of marginal, but you may be able to um, get the right tomatoes uh, from that. Um, and there is a cherry tomato variety um, that's called Sweet 100, or Super Sweet 100 is another one. And in some tomato trials that were done a few years ago, that one was judged as the best tasting tomato on the planet. Sweet 100 or Super Sweet 100. And those grow like weeds in Flagstaff. I mean, they grow like crazy and you'll get tons of uh, ripe fruit from this. For tomatoes, that's probably the ones I would suggest, but there are lots and lots of other ones out there that you can do, as long as you stick with shorter season varieties. Patio type tomato varieties tend to work very well in Siberian varieties, and there are a lot of those out that will say Siberian this and Siberian that. Uh, those tend to work um, quite well too. One other tried and true variety, not for tomatoes, but from the other challenging crop, which is corn. Uh, people have lots of problems growing corn um, in the five step area. My favorite variety of sweet corn is one called Incredible. I grow that every single year and every single year. And even where I live now at a lower elevation, it works really well here uh, as well. Uh, but in five step, it, it made a good crop year after year after year after year. Probably have grown that one for more than um, 20 years. Um, it's a full size corn, you know, it gets seven or eight feet tall. Uh, the ears are a foot or more long. It's a yellow sweet corn. And it's fabulous. It's, it's an incredible variety. What other things you want to know? <laughs> so, since this is a beginning vegetable gardening class, Sure. What would you recommend for people who might be intimidated to get going? And what crops do you think are probably going to be the most successful for folks to get started with? Okay. The easiest vegetable of all to grow is radishes. They only require about 30 days. They're not fussy. I think anybody could grow radishes. <laughs> have tried to do that. They're a cool weather crop, so they do really well. So that's one easy suggestion. Uh, onions are very, very easy to grow, particularly if you grow them from sets, which are the small bulbs. Um, I don't know that you can kill those, even if you tried, um, because they are so tough 
So onions grow very, very well. Um, things that are in the cabbage family generally are pretty easy to grow. Things like kale, broccoli, cabbage um, do extremely well. They take up a lot of room, so you have to have a lot of space for those. But you, particularly with broccoli, for example, you can get a whole lot of food off of just a few plants. And broccoli does extraordinarily well, um, I think, in flat start. Uh, zucchini is famous for how well it does <laughs> in five staff. So if you want to grow it, keep in mind that that one's a warm weather crop, but it doesn't take a whole lot of days uh, to maturity. So zucchini is one that you can try with the precaution that you don't plant too much of it or you will have way more than what you need. Um, lettuce and spinach, very, very easy to grow. Um, Peas are very, very easy to grow. Uh, all of those, peas, spinach, lettuce, can be planted very, very early. They can be planted in April. Even if it's still snowing or um, very cold, uh, they're, they're still OK. They're very, very tough. In fact, spinach needs cold, cold soil in order to germinate. And peas are one of my favorite things to grow, just again, because the flavor of fresh grown peas is incredible. They don't taste like anything that you buy at all. I mean, um, in fact, it's hard to get those from the garden into the house. They usually get eaten before they make it uh, into the house, particularly if you grow snap peas, such as sugar snap peas. They're so wonderful um, to eat, and they're easy to grow, very, very easy. Where you have more difficulty is with some of the other warm weather crops. Cucumbers can, unless you live in some of the banana belt areas around Flagstaff, those are a little more challenging to grow. Tomatoes are quite challenging to grow. There's a lot of um, things to consider uh, when you're growing tomatoes. And to do that, you need to take my tomato class to figure out, <laughs> to figure out all the tricks on uh, growing tomatoes. Corn, as I mentioned, tends to be a little more uh, challenging. Um, pumpkins and winter squash can be more challenging and they take up a lot of space. Melons are really challenging and I would stay away from those um, unless you're going to do a whole lot of extra um, finagling and with those. So basically any of those cool weather crops in general, you'll probably be fine. So, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. That, oh, it looks like Hattie's got this one answered, but somebody is um, new to Flagstaff and she's just wondering if, if you can grow in the soil here and do we contain our garden or grow in a greenhouse, but you know, we're going to have an entire class on how you can um, improve your soil here in northern Arizona and then also I'll be speaking on container gardening next week. And actually container gardening is a really um, great option here. Um, so we'll talk more about that next week. And we, you can grow a lot of um, food crops in, <clears throat> excuse me, container gardens. Um, do you have anything else to say about that, Jim? Just on um, um, No, container gardens work really well. And getting back to tomatoes, for example, I always grow those in containers. And that's from learning from trial and error over the years. I've just had much more success growing tomatoes in containers. So that's something you might want to address um, during your, during, uh, your talk uh, next week. And raised beds work really well, do extremely well. In container gardening, greenhouse gardening, all that works really well. Again, precaution when it comes to soil, you do have to do something with the soil. You can't just use it as is. Um, another question that we have is, well, oh, wait, that skipped. Are there any veggies that you can plant the seeds directly in the garden or do you, most of them you have to start inside? So next week, we're gonna talk a whole lot about that because it's all that whole the whole class is focused on starting seeds 
and then plant care after you've grown out your plants. But Jim, if you want to throw out maybe just a couple of varieties that do okay when you direct um, seed them in the ground. Sure. Um, lots of them will do fine with direct seeding. Um, things that are leafy, like wet spinach, um, endive, those kinds of things, you can easily direct seed. However, they transplant well also. Um, some, uh, there's just, you know, there are a lot. Beans, corn, all of that, I always direct seed. I never transplant uh, any of those. Um, there are some things that you absolutely do not want to direct seed. Those basically are root crops, like beets, carrots, for example. Those do not transplant well at all. But other things, such as members of the cabbage family, you almost you would always grow them from transplants. If you're going to grow them from seeds, start them inside to move out uh, later on. Um, and some things like corn, for example, you can do either way. You can do transplants or you can do direct from seed, but transplanting corn is too much work because <laughs> you need a lot of it to have enough of it to um, get a crop. But yeah, there are lots and lots. Um, basically, salad items are ones that you can direct seed in general. This is a really, <clears throat> excuse me, great question, Jim, because I know that you're familiar with this. Are there, and you've taught on this topic, are there any perennial vegetables that we can grow here in Flagstaff? Oh, yes. <laughs> and we'll be talking about that in tomorrow's class. <laughs> um, yes, there are basically four uh, perennial vegetables that do well here. Number one is asparagus. Um, asparagus grows extremely well. Uh, in the Flagstaff area. It does take some time and it does require some room. Uh, it takes several years for most perennial vegetables before you're able to grow a crop. In fact, there are some, well, there, I don't know if they're still there, but there were some historic um, asparagus gardens out in the Doney Park area that had been there for like 40, 50 years in some of the old homesteads out there. I don't know if they're still there or not, but uh, it used to be. So it can last a long, long time. So asparagus is probably number one. Um, the other ones are rhubarb. Uh, rhubarb does um, really, really well. Um, Jerusalem artichoke uh, is another perennial vegetable that does really well. Now, Jerusalem artichoke, you may not even be familiar with what that is. Those are not the green artichokes like you buy in the store that uh, come from California. That's a globe artichoke, which is an entirely different animal. And those you cannot grow in the five cents. Jerusalem artichokes are a tuber that look like a potato. And it's the tuber that grows underground that you harvest. The plant looks like a sunflower. And I think it's part of the sunflower family. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's uh, what they are. It's perennial, it grows from year to year, and you use the tubers set like you would use potatoes. However, the inulin content in that and how they metabolize your body is different from potatoes. They're more easily digestible, and people that are in diabetic diets actually tend to do better with Jerusalem artichokes than with potatoes. So that's kind of a fun crop to grow too, and they're really pretty because it looks like you have a bunch of sunflowers when it's actually uh, Jerusalem artichokes um, that you're growing. Um, and the other one is, the fourth one is horseradish. And that grows extraordinarily well. In fact, that's hard to get rid of once you had it. When I was growing in a community garden plot, somebody had grown horseradish in that plot prior. And that's the only thing that was still there when we took over that plot. And we couldn't get rid of it. I mean, we dug it out, we dug it out, we pulled it out, and it still kept coming back from, I don't know what, from two molecules that were left in there, I guess. I'm not sure. But um, that's an easy one. And it's perennial. So those are basically the ones. Uh, great. Thanks. I'm just scanning the chat box. I think so far that we've covered everything, unless we still have a little bit of time. If you, if you guys want to pick Jim's brain a little more, um, he's open 
to it. And he's just such a really great resource. So I'll just um, wait and see if anybody else um, puts anything in the uh, chat box. And right now we're seeing um, Frank says, great job to you <laughs> and other fellow master gardeners. Okay, uh, this is a good question. Where do you get the wood for the raised beds? Any suggestions? Um, good question. Basically, I, I think it's, well, you can just get wood anywhere, you know, a lumber yard. Depends on how long you want to use it. Um, redwood is probably the most durable one. It's going to be more expensive. Uh, fir is also desirable as a wood to use uh, for raised beds. Um, some raised beds are made out of railroad ties. It's probably not advisable to use railroad ties because the preservative agents in the railroad ties can reach out into the soil and can be somewhat toxic. So it's probably best to stay away from that. But you don't have to use wood. I mean, I've seen them built out of fancy rocks, you know, block work. Um, the raised beds that I currently have are cement blocks. Um, I've read that you really shouldn't use cement blocks because the lime can leach out of the cement blocks into the soil, but I just use extra acidifier. And I don't think I've observed any problems using cement blocks when I've been using those particular raised beds for six years now. So, you know, be creative and you can do them however you want. You can use plastics. In fact, you can get pre-made ones, prefab ones on Gardener Supply for one, for one, which is a catalog that has prefab plastic um, raised beds, which you can buy. They're simple, e really easy. You just, they send you all the stuff and you just put them together. They kind of snap together. Yeah, we'll look at, um, I've got some uh, photos of a whole bunch of different kinds of raised beds and containers. People are asking about um, containers in the chat as well. And we'll just look at, a, um, many examples from around Flagstaff that we have um, and, and some of our local gardens. So we will address more that more next week. Um, let's see. Oh man, they're coming in really quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what are the primary soil additives that you use, Jim? What I personally use, mm -hmm. well, the best thing to use is compost, of course. That's number one. Uh, I use a lot of manures and just whatever I can find. Um, I, have, I have used a lot of horse manure over the years because it was readily available. It tends to be kind of weedy, however, and uh, you can get a lot of, a lot of weeds coming up uh, using horse manure. Poultry manure is fabulous to use as long as it's well well seasoned and isn't fresh or it can burn the plants. Rabbit manure is extraordinarily good to use. Llama manure is really an alpaca. It works really, really well. Also, and rabbit manure and, and lemon alpaca manure, you can actually put on your garden fresh and it doesn't have to be composted um, particularly like the other ones do. And again, the best time to put all that stuff on is in the fall, so there has time to uh, to compost. And I've used commercial compost that I bought at Home Depot in various places that's already bad. Just depends what I can get my hands on from year to year. Uh, currently, uh, where I live, the neighbor down the street has chickens and goats and pigs and all kinds of stuff. So uh, I just go down there anytime and get whatever I want, which is kind of nice. Yeah, um, I just, also, oh, sorry. Use, I was going to say I use soil acidifiers also, and that's just soil sulfur. And because um, our soils tend to be very alkaline, that's added in the spring. And I do use some chemical fertilizers as well. 10, 10, 10 is the type that I use. And again, that goes on in spring and summer. Um, that gives the plants kind of a fast uh, nutrient boost when you use a chemical fertilizer. Anyway. But you know, I do all of the organic stuff along with it, not just strictly that. And then just um, 
uh, Frank, our, one of our master gardeners, Frank Granham, is going to be giving an entire class on soil amendments and how, the ways that we can improve our soils here and in Northern Arizona. So one, uh, one person is wondering, um, so she's saying that home properties are pretty close together in her neighborhood. Should she worry about neighbors using insecticides nearby? And again, we'll have another class all about pest management. But um, if you want to answer that, Jim, you can. If not, then I can answer it. I personally probably wouldn't worry too much of that. It depends too whether the properties are fenced and how they're fenced. I mean, if you have opaque fencing there, not too much is going to travel uh, from property to property. Uh, I don't know. It kind of depends on how aggressive. Uh, somebody is spraying if somebody is spraying. Yeah, I would say if they're not using I, it properly, I mean, then there's a chance for drift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest problem is a weed and feed for lawn. This is Hattie. Okay. But one of the best things that you can do is share your zucchini that you have too many of with your neighbors <laughs> and say, I'm growing these organically and ha help teach them that maybe they don't want to use an insecticide. Well, it looks like the chat has slowed down um, and the class is about wrapped up. So um, if nobody else has questions specifically on planning your garden um, for Jim, then we will call it a night. There are some really, really great um, questions in the chat box tonight. Um, I'll, we will be covering topics, including improving your soils, um, starting seeds and uh, pest management and in later classes. So stay tuned for that. And hopefully you'll turn, tune in for those classes to learn more. Um, and with that, I will thank Jim so much for donating his time to help all of us make or help to help make all of us better gardeners here in Flagstaff and other parts of Northern Arizona. And um, you're getting a lot of thank yous and great jobs in the chat box. Um, these recordings are going to be posted Monday or sorry, uh, Wednesday morning. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing all of you again next week.